Hey Faith Family, welcome to the Beyond Sunday podcast at Calvary Bible, where we go beyond the Sunday sermon to explore some rabbit holes and to bring some biblical truths to the surface. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Calvary Bible Church, welcome back. Beyond Sunday, Pastor Randy. It is Beyond Sunday. And myself, it always is Beyond Sunday. Or before Sunday. When we record this. It is before Sunday. So it depends. And we want to apply the Bible both before and after <laughs> we do. Sunday. So guess what? Yes, we do. Uh, I've got one tailor-made for you today. You have exegetical insights? No. Into the Psalter? No, not yet. Well, you will get there. Um, did you hear the joke about the pop fly? Thankfully, I did not. Yeah, good, because it was way over your head. Oh, that's good. That's weak. Very lame. Thank you. Uh, it's, what, it's what the goal is. That was not a Maddie joke. Hers are usually a little more... Mm-hmm. More, um, more sophisticated. Finesse. Sophisticated is a good word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. she's She will be smarter than me. Uh, I can pretty it's much nice. guarantee it's that. It's nice. That's a good feeling for a parent to know that your children are going to be smarter than you. Yeah, it is a good feeling. I think it is. They're sharper in a lot of ways. Um, good. All right. So we're in Psalm 69, mm-hmm. the large psalm. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you took a, an angle on it that was, I don't want to say unique, but there's you could have gone a number of different directions. So my question for you, at least to get started, was, can you just kind of summarize the general mood of the psalm? Your angle was zeal for the house of the Lord, mm-hmm. but that wasn't the only way you could have gone. So just can you sum up that whole psalm? Because there was other yeah. pieces going on there. Yeah. The first thing is, you know, Dan Pierce stopped me afterwards and said, there's a lot more. And are you going to cover more of mm-hmm. it? There's a lot more in it. And I said, no. And he said, he said, well, what happened to a verse by verse exposition? And yeah. I said, it's not happening. It's uh, never been your practice. Well, it, it, it has, but the, let me just say this to everyone uh, and to you uh, in particular. So there is, there's so much repetition in the Psalms. Mm-hmm. So for instance, in Psalm 69, the front of that Psalm, the very familiar request for deliverance. Mm-hmm. And so the mood is one of desperation. Yes. If we're going to mm-hmm. talk about mood, then the psalmist is desperate because the situation is so dire that he really, he, he, he I want to say literally, because if we know the history of David and from the, from the Old Testament, mm-hmm. he's literally uh, near death mm-hmm. a number of times in his life. Yeah. So it's not a stretch to say literally he's near death. Figuratively, we know he is because of the emotional turmoil and so forth. So, but, so that's, yeah. that answers the mood. Mm-hmm. Get back to uh, Dan's uh, statement quickly, though. Um, so you've got the very familiar pleas for help at the beginning of the psalm, and then the psalm ends with the very familiar uh, aspects of praise. Mm-hmm. So yep. that's often the route, and it'll be that way this coming Sunday, Lord willing, in Psalm 72. You have starting out with a petition, and you end with praise. So those elements are so familiar to us because we've been reading the Psalms together for a while. Mm -hmm. So my intention is not to cover those every week. So that left me with, uh, with one, uh, actually one Avenue that I felt like was fruitful for us. And that was, I just selected five aspects of prayer or five elements of prayer that (laughs) we should consider making a part of our prayer life since the Psalter is designed to teach us how to pray. Mm -hmm. So that's the angle. But yeah. the mood, I did answer that question, though, the, the desperation. Yeah, desperation. Um, so zeal for the house of the Lord was the specific route we took through this psalm. Um, can you can you give me, like, what is that zeal? I th- did you use the word excitement, or is this like an over... Uh, I can't think of a good word, but... The two words I used were, if I remember correctly, great enthusiasm. Yeah. So you experience great enthusiasm for the house of God, and then you're expending great energy. Mm-hmm. So you, there's a two sort of a two. The zeal is this. I'm giving all of my attention to this because there's enthusiasm, and therefore I'm going to pour all my energies into the house of God. So the best I could come up with is like someone. A phrase I'll use <clears throat> sometimes is just frothing at the mouth. There's an enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. They're just getting For all something. worked yep. up about mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. and the energy is just ready to go. Yeah. Now you combined or not combined? Are you uh, kind of made a correlation between the house of the Lord and mm-hmm. Psalms to the church mm-hmm. today? Yeah. So how and why is that important? Yeah. The first thing is that 
uh, we know that this particular psalm does deal with worship. I mean, it, it, you you think about the psalms in that in that way anyway. Mm -hmm. But in this particular case, to say you know this is uh, you know for zeal for your house has consumed me. So we have uh, you know David experiencing this passion, which I think was the New Living Translations translation of that term, if I remember correctly. There's passion for entering into a place of worship. Now, we also know that when Jesus, uh, when John's gospel records in chapter 2, I believe it's in verse 15, when John's gospel records Jesus mm -hmm. overturning the, the money changers' tables and yep. so forth in mm -hmm. the temple, so now you have that same, uh, this same verse now being applied to that situation. So here he is in the temple, the place of worship, but obviously it's not worshipful at all. And Jesus literally goes berserk in that scenario. So the jump to the church is simply where else does corporate worship take place regularly amongst the people of God? Gotcha. Uh, so how do we go about that in the church? Like, is it a, is a mindset? Is it a willingness to confront uh, sin like Jesus did within the church? Um, or does it look differently? Uh, is it, what does zeal look like now? Yeah, so, for the house. Yeah, so a couple of things that we talked about on Sunday, you can ask yourself, you know, beyond Sunday, am I, am I eager uh, for, the, for corporate worship? Uh, that's where I started. Uh, it's not where I started. I'm sorry. I started with, uh, am I eager to meet with God? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, earlier, yeah. earlier this morning, how did I, how did I approach my own time with God this morning? Um, I read yesterday, I think it was yesterday morning. I read a book, I was reading a book and I, I want to say it, it might've been the old, pr the old prayer book, uh, Valley of Vision, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it was yesterday. They, they, their author said something about, is it out of duty that I'm doing this? Yeah. And, and, and so this morning was a great reminder to me, you know, do I really, do I really, am I anxious to get into the presence of God by myself this morning because I love God? So their zeal for the house means zeal. And, and I think I said this Sunday, zeal for the house, the word house here is, is actually used for God himself. It's not, it's not just the, the 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 physical place it's the god who resides there the otherwise there's no meaning in it yeah so um so I, I would say that what it looks like is my own passion for being in the presence of god then then second it is the way in which i look forward to coming to church here that's part yeah. of it do i look forward to that is that an exciting uh, uh, an exciting prospect for me and then the third thing i mentioned in church if i remember correctly was uh because because I'm I'm gonna be here with you guys. Mm -hmm. with you all get to of see you. me. I get to see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as if so, I don't enough. <laughs> <laughs> so for someone who's not zealous to be in the presence of the Lord, not excited to see you and me, how 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 do you get through those seasons? How do you yeah. work that zeal back up? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, for me, uh, you know, for me personally. Um, my zeal for coming to worship on Sunday is built on a week long, uh, a week long processing, contemplating, look at what God has done for me. Mm -hmm. There's no other way around this. It is, it is becoming caught up in the mercy and grace of God in my life that fuels my worship time. And so I would say to you, if you're, if worship is not your thing, if coming to church is you do it because of habit or duty or because you think you're supposed to, or those are synonymous. Yeah. If that's the case, then please reintroduce yourself and keep rereading the story. Put yourself in the story of redemption. And then I think you're going to catch, I, I, the Holy Spirit is going to use the word of God to ignite mm -hmm. uh, a passion for, for God. Yeah. And another way I would think about that is preaching the gospel to yourself, like mm -hmm. whether it was Jerry Bridges or the guy who yeah. informed Jerry Bridges, yeah. preach the gospel to yourself every day. And when you understand that reality, yeah, that will, that should stir your affections for the Lord and gratefulness. It has to, if you have ears to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which that gets us to a little bit earlier in the Psalm. Mm -hmm. So uh, David here recognizes his own folly in verse five. Um, 
So we sometimes have our own part to play in not maybe having our own zeal for the Lord. There's this like confession part almost where he's asking for God to save him from himself almost. Yeah. And the connection here though was not, was not connected to lack of zeal. This actually is explaining, if I remember correctly, this is explaining, uh, this is said in the context of he's under attack. Mm -hmm. And so if you look quickly at verses one through four, he's waiting for God to help him. And it, it, what's what's important, though, is that he speaks to God uh, about his own foolishness. And here's what I think is, is critical. If I am a victim, which David was, if I'm a victim of certain circumstances and people, that, uh, that poses a threat that I'm going to be so self-focused on my hurt mm -hmm. that I am not able to be clear about my own sinfulness. And this is where this part of the, this, which I think was the very first part of the psalm for us on Sunday, for David to admit this in the midst of his, his being attacked is very important for any of us that have a victim mentality. So I can't be self-focused only on the fact that I am victimized. I have to remember that I have been offending God as well. Mm -hmm. And that puts my relationship with God uh, in, in real perspective and it helps me stay away from just one end of the spectrum of, God, you got to help me because look at what these people are doing to me. I need to remember what I'm doing to him. Yeah. And it's a nice, it's a very humbling thing for a victim to express their own, their own offense. Yeah. So can I, I want to kind of transition sure. into a, a question that we got mm -hmm. back when the podcast was mm -hmm. stalled out. Mm -hmm. Um I forget what psalm it was exactly. It's going back just uh, about a month about mm -hmm. God's anger mm -hmm. towards us and our sin. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question came in, like, is God angry with me when I sin? And if I'm remembering right, kind of the, um, the one of the main thoughts in the sermon was just that, that God is angry uh, with us. But then how how do we justify that reading in psalm? Do you got it? Is it familiar what passage it was? No, I'm going back to a different Psalm, oh, Psalm okay. 6, but go ahead. Okay, so how do we justify or rectify God's wrath and anger towards sin, but then, and, and potentially us, but then understanding on this side of the cross mm -hmm. that there's no condemnation because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Right. He has mm -hmm. taken God's wrath right. for us. So, so I think the difference is thinking about the emotion and this let's start with the emotions of God as revealed in scripture. So the emotions of God with respect to justification mm -hmm. means that we're at peace with him and he does not feel animosity towards us any longer. Mm -hmm. The emotions of God with respect to justification, because there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. So mm -hmm. there's no anger of the condemning kind. Yeah. But, but listen to Psalm six, one, O oh Lord, Rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. That's a child of God speaking to God. And he's not, and, and David here is not concerned that God's anger is going to, is, is going to condemn him. Mm -hmm. This is, there's line A and line B. Line A, the word rebuke. Line B, the word discipline. So this is, this is the emotion of God toward one of his sons. And so I think the question is theologically, how could God be something other, other than angry at sin? How could he be something other than angry at sin? That's, it's a logical question in mm -hmm. light of a psalm like this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, and I've, I've, I have covered this question or attempted to dialogue about this particular question uh, over the past week or so, too, with others. And so... The difficulty is we say, well, now that we have Christ, God can't be angry with us anymore. Well, on what basis would you say that? You could say your sins are forgiven. Yeah. Well, they are. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that in the moment of sin and my rebelling against God, that God isn't feel anything about? Does he, d d is his anger? Uh, is, it redirected? Is, is it not redirected? Is it, is it erased? Is all of the anger of God erased 
uh, because I'm in Christ. because of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the other passage that I would go to in the New Testament was would be in Hebrews 12, where we talk about the discipline of God. So here is the discipline of God in Psalm 6, 1. Hebrews 12 also talks about the discipline of God. And we know that we know that God can't be happy with sin because of his holiness. Yeah. So the question is, does Christ cover it all? Meaning God is never angry with us anymore. Now, it's not an exact theological statement. Okay. I but, love those. But you and I, we, I mean, I had a dad, you have a dad. Mm -hmm. So we both, if we, if we both look at the way our fathers treated us when we were young sons, mm -hmm. can we say that our dads weren't angry with us when we sinned, when we acted like idiots? No, I can, can I just say I am a dad right now with kids in the house. There you go. And so that happens. So I think, you know, again, this is not foolproof theological but my biggest concern is is when someone would say, well, God isn't angry at us ever anymore because of Christ. Mm -hmm. So I think we, what we're doing is we're separating, we, we're merging together when we should be separating the condemnation of God, which is now done with Christ, but we still at times face his discipline, which means our sins cause him pain. Wouldn't you say that we're separating when we should be merging? Like we're separate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe yeah. it's just another way of thinking about it, but we're trying to be a very black and white with God's anger and God's, you know, forgiveness while he's he's doing both at the same time. He's loving us while he's frustrated with us. Yeah, he's loving us while he's disciplining us. And the question yeah. is, the only emotion that I can see in the Bible with respect to discipline, and David hits on it. Yeah. And and the thing to not forget is that he is both. In his discipline, when I'm disciplining my kids, I don't want them to lose sight of, I, I, I love you. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that does not yeah. leave me. Listen, listen, the other thing too, just any, if you're, th if you're really thinking hard about this issue, then you also have to consider all of the scriptures, Old and New Testament, that talk about the fear of God. So there's nothing in scripture that would say that we should not fear God any longer because we're in Christ. Otherwise, all of the warning passages are gone. Yeah. And I know the warning passages get interpreted differently, but our way of reading it for years has been, do not water down the warning passages because you are eternally secure. Your eternal security is not affected by these warning passages because you will fear God. You have ears to hear, something along those lines. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've said this a lot. Yeah. This is going to allow me to check off another stalled out podcast question from a month ago or so. Um Side note question, though, is there a difference between holy and righteous? There's a difference. How would you describe that? I mean, that semantically, difference? just the meaning yeah. of the two are different. They're um, not total synonyms. No. Mm -mm. So, how would no. you define holiness? The holy? You know, holy is uh, normally defined as God being totally separate from all of, all of his creatures. The biggest separation is. He's not subject to decay or change, mm -hmm. and he's certainly not affected. He's, he does not experience sin. So he's, he's, he's separated from all of that that yeah. we are. And so his righteousness is part of what makes him holy. Could we say that? Or I'd go the other way around. His holiness is what makes him righteous. His, his, his righteousness is, is the, the standard, a rightness about his ways, which are all determined by his unique character. It's because of who he is, which includes his righteousness. That so righteousness is, is this, this standard of his ways being their right. Or, and I'll use a term that Derek Kidner, I just learned this morning, that righteousness is properly functioning. And so here's God, who is the standard of what is proper functioning as a person. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, yeah. I'm it's not getting, sure of the angle. Well, they're, yeah. They're not, they're, they're not synonyms. No. I'll start with and that. that's just the question. So yeah, I think you answered it. Uh, I think we can tie a nice little bow on this and get back to the end of Psalm 69, where it's this imprecatory psalm. Where oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We are praying for God to blot the names of my enemies out of the book of life. So Whew, that's harsh. That is, it is harsh. 
Um, but I think one of the things you said, <laughs> one of the, no, you didn't, thankfully. Uh, one of the things you said though, that I think was helpful was remembering that there's a, there comes a point where justice stops, or where, I'm sorry, where love stops giving way to justice. Yeah. Justice, love is eclipsed. Someone sense. said love is now being eclipsed by justice at this moment. It, it can't, God, God will not inevitably be able to do both. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he will not be able to love everyone and be just at the same time because everyone will not bow in submission to him until the judgment occurs and they're forced to bow the knee. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Um, Well, I was just thinking. Let me quickly say too, some of you, and you might be one of those that familiar with C.S. Lewis. So C.S. Lewis will vehemently say that we should not be praying these. This is one of, it's one of a few places where I sort of veer away from C.S. Lewis. I don't think, I don't think the uh, the reasoning that he gives, which is kind of, and I'm saying this with fear and trepidation, I don't think his reasoning is great, which is so weird to say about. C.S. What Lewis. would his reasoning be? It, it just th- that there that this is carnal. That these are not these are not prayers that are to be prayed uh, in the best of times, or something along those lines. But there's several other authors that just they don't think that this is appropriate. It, I mean, and obviously, I mean, it feels harsh. And even because yeah. we're supposed to love our enemies, yeah. so why are we praying for their destruction? Them. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, does it help? And correct me if I'm wrong. To remember that behind the the physical reality is a spiritual reality, and maybe behind isn't the best way to phrase it, mm-hmm. but you know what I'm saying. There's a there's a spiritual reality there that is at at work and coming against me as a child of God mm-hmm. that I want to pray against. I just read this morning in Ephesians 6, so the, the, the famous arm, put on the armor of God that you'd be able to stand. Yeah. And, and you're standing in the strength of the Lord. And so, yes, to realize that your soul is under attack and that it is um, f- potentially fatal, that those, that this warfare is potentially mm-hmm. fatal. Yeah. So that is, I, I think that's helpful. Remember, all I try to do on Sunday is say, don't dismiss these too quickly. I think the mm-hmm. average reader is going to read that and say, wow, should we still be praying that? And the New Testament is pretty clear. You know, Jesus teaches this and that. But as I tried to say, the New Testament also has curses and imprecation. So it's not an Old Testament phenomenon that can be destroyed by someone saying, well, that's in the Old Testament. It doesn't apply to us anymore mm-hmm. because the New Testament does. Jesus, Jude. Paul, okay. uh, Jesus, Paul, and Revela- the end of Revelation. Can you give me one of those just off the top of your well, head? Paul, for instance, in Galatians says, if you're preaching any other gospel, let him be cursed. Yeah. So there's one. Yeah. And, and, and I, there's all kinds of arguments around this. Look, my <laughs> point is to say, and I think my best, my best help for me was every morning I pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Yeah. Your as soon as I pray that, what is going to happen to the enemy? Mm-hmm. I want him to come. We cannot be totally saved unless he comes. Yeah. And when he comes, in order to totally save, he will have to rid us not only of our sin within, but he'll also have to rid the world of rebellion without, including Satan. Yeah. The Good. world, the flesh, and the devil. All three of those enemies are going to be defeated. So whenever you pray the Lord's Prayer, you are implying imprecation. Um, I'm going to extend this podcast by just a couple minutes. Oh, I knew Even it. That was I a nice little bow, it. but it's going to scratch my itch. I've got one more question that came in that okay. it starts to tie in here a little bit. Jordan's going to be the one that, that dictates whether this whether this even goes to and He's going to, to be air. fine. He's going to be fine. His wife likes long episodes. So that could help. That could help you. Yes. Um, This actually was a question that came in on a week that I preached, but I'm going to ask for your input here too. Um, So this was the going back to the exile back in the Advent series, right? Yeah. Uh, So Mm -hmm. in Genesis 3.15, it talks about the serpent's Mm -hmm. offspring. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to who the serpent's offspring are compared to Eve's. Um, And... I actually answered this question when it was fresh in my mind, mm-hmm. uh, but then that podcast Go got lost yeah. in the you know the dark hole, black holes of the internet mm. um, well, or the you do digital it. world. Well, yeah. So the the offspring of Eve is singular, which is pointing forward mm. to we believe Jesus, 
Okay, it's not the offsprings. Mm -hmm. uh, so just not all of humankind. It's pointing forward to Jesus. But I don't have a great answer as to who the offspring of the serpent is, other than to recognize that Satan is behind the serpent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't believe that Satan has an offspring or a seed like Eve did. Um, there's the demonic spiritual world. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that in what happened on the cross, mm -hmm. Uh, the the crushing of Satan's head mm -hmm. happened through Jesus, the offspring of Eve, and the serpent is just that offspring himself. How does that sit with you? It, it's it's fine. I I think one uh, you know one comment since we're keeping this short, right? <laughs> yeah, might as well is that uh, immediately in the next chapter, mm -hmm. it's possible that you have the two offsprings. In mind, in sight, Can't, through Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we might be saying, you know, this is something to cont contemplate, right? We might be yeah. saying that that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent come from the same seed, which is think that through now, right? Mm -hmm. You have two brothers. Mm -hmm. One of them is righteous, and the other is not. Mm -hmm. One's a murderer, right? So. It's possible that what we're dealing with early on is, okay, here's an example. Here's the first example in the Bible of the conflict between the two seeds. And then throughout redemptive history, you have a human element, which is also demonized. As you said, Satan behind, the serpent behind is the way you put it. Yeah. And then the follow-up to that initial question was, what does that enmity look like in the world today? And I think that gets to that question. It's the spiritual forces of evil versus good that and we all see kinds play of, out. All kinds of unrighteousness. Yeah. I mean, the sky's the limit. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that was the best I could do to answer that um, offspring question as far as the offspring of the, the serpent mm -hmm. or the snake. But enmity is there. And will the always friction. be there. Yeah. Until Christ the opposition. comes back. Yeah. Um, good. How'd well, we do? I think we're less than shorter than a half hour. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And hopefully, yeah, our goal is right around that 20 minute mark. So now that we're through all the questions from the past, it should be a little shorter. All right. Unless my joke time gets expanded. God help us. <laughs> All right, great. Hey, listen, uh, again, we love the, uh, the back and forth. We love the questions that come in. If you have any, uh, on a Sunday morning, write them down. Randy's even okay if you email them during the sermon so you don't forget them. Podcast at cbcmj.com. Can I say that for you? Yeah. <laughs> Write I'm them. trying to think it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like Podcast people taking at, notes. Oh, yeah. I was going right? to say, are you okay with me saying while you're preaching, people oh, can yeah. email them? Yeah. They, you ought to see what they do. I, I can Just only. come up and stand with me sometimes. Yeah, well, it's I've, fun. I've seen them. It's fun. They are fun. Um, so, yeah. Podcast at cbcmj.com. Uh, we appreciate the questions. And... Yeah, we'll get back at it again next week after Psalm 72. Dose 72. All right. Thanks. Love you guys. Thanks again for joining us on today's episode. And remember, our Sunday sermons are meant to lead us to a life of worship beyond Sunday.